Hi everyone, and welcome to AutoCAD. My name is Ari, and I'm an AEC Technical Specialist and AutoCAD Professional with Digital Drafting Systems. Today, we're going to delve into the world of arrays. There are three different kinds of arrays. Let's look at rectangular arrays first. Let's select our function, then we can select the object that we'd like to array, and then press Enter. Now we've initiated the array command, and our ribbon has created a new tab called Array Creation. Let's modify some parameters within our array. We can change our columns from 4 to 5. We now have an extra column. And we can change our rows from 3 to 5. We now have two extra rows. We can also change the distance between our columns and rows. Let's change our distance from 30 to 40 between our columns. And let's change our row distance from 15 to 20. You might have also noticed that our total distances between rows and columns were changed when the distance between individual rows and columns was changed. So let's see what happens if we change our total distance from 160 in between columns to 150. Now our distance between each column is 37.5 units. Let's change our distance between rows, the total distance, from 80 to 100. And now our distance between each row is 25 units. So our distance between and our total distances are linked together. And these distances are measured by the center point or the base point to the end point or the last column slash row. Now there's one more setting that we can turn on and off. Usually the setting is on by default and it's called associative. If we were to leave this on, then our entire array would still be an array. All objects would be linked into one smart object together, and we can modify the array further. If we then close the array, we can't turn this feature on or off anymore, and instead, we'd have to explode the array in order to manipulate individual objects. If we want to immediately, uh, so to speak, explode our array, we can turn associative off, and now if I close the array, each object is its own independent entity. So let's make that array one more time. We're going to now choose our array command, select our object, right click or enter. The array has been created. Now we're going to leave associative on and we're going to close our array. Now if we select any object in the array, it's all part of the same array once again. The associative option is gone. Now we can do things like editing the source, which means that we can edit the object in the source and all the other objects will then change. We can reset the array back to its original parameters. We can replace an item in the array, and that way all the other objects will change as well. And we can change our base point so that future array edits will not affect columns and rows that are not associated with that same base point. So right now, this base point is here in the first column and the first row. So all subsequent columns and rows will be affected by modifications from that base point. Let's look at the second type of arrays called a path array. We can select it, select our object, and we can select any path that we'd like, whether it's a polyline, a spline, or even just a simple line. Now our array is following along this path quite nicely. Now I selected a part of the path in particular in order for this to work. I want to show you what happens if you select a part of the path that's after the first vertice. In this case, the first vertice is this point right here. So I selected the path initially before the first vertice, so my array was correct. If I was to select this part of the path or this part of the path after the first vertice, we're going to get a bit of an error. Let me show you guys what that looks like. So I'm going to select my object again. This time I'll select right here in the middle of the spline. And now we have this odd error. It seems like the path is actually facing the opposite direction from which we intended it to face. And all of our objects have arrayed in quite an odd way. So when you want to use the path array, make sure that you are selecting the initial part of the path before the first vertice, so right around here. So now our path array is complete. We can also allow it to be associative and not associative, just like the rectangular array if we wanted to. For now, we'll leave it as associative so that we can modify it in the future. And we can, instead of being able to change our items directly, we can change the distance between items. What happens is the path array is fixed along the path. So right now, I can only have so many items with a distance of 30 in between them. So if I change my distance to 20, I now have seven items to work with. And if I make my distance even smaller, I now have nine items with a distance of 15 units in between them. So I can continue to change the distance between items to add more items to the count. Let's change it back to 30. We can also increase our rows. 
So let's increase that from 1 to 3 in this case. And now you can see that the extra items have now been included as if there were more splines at a certain distance from each other. So let's pretend that this, there was a spline to the left of the original spline with a distance of 15 feet in between it and the other uh, splines. Now let's see what happens if we change that to 20. So our objects are now spaced even further. And so we can manipulate our distancing and our spacing between objects in this way. Let's change it back to 15, and we'll change our rows back to 1. Of course, our total distance is also changing when we change the distance in between certain objects. Then, of course, we can do, just like in the rectangular array, we can modify our levels and our row increment. We'll look at that further because these are 3D elements that don't affect the 2D space. We can also modify our base point, just like we could in the rectangular array. Our tangent direction can be changed as well, and we can use a distance, a, an actual um, manual distance between certain objects to locate other objects. So we can manually change our distance through this measure tool, and we can change our alignment. So instead of the objects following the curve of the spline, I can force them to maintain their same alignment as they follow along on the spline. So let's align our items again, and we already know how associative works, so let's close our array. And now let's click on it one more time, and you can see that just like with the rectangular array, the associative option is now gone because in order to deassociate the array from itself, we would have to go to home and then explode the array with the explode tool like this. And now each object in the array is its own separate entity. Let's look at the third type of array. It's called a polar array. We can select our function, select our object, and we can then use any midpoint or any point to rotate around. So in this case, I've made a circle, and I'd like to use the center point of this circle. Now I have a polar array with six items by default. I can modify the number of items by changing them from 6 to 10, for example. I can also change the distance between them, and this is actually quite important. Right now, the fill is 360 degrees. But if I change this distance from 36 to, let's say, 20 or so, now, the fill is at 180 degrees, and we are not filling the entire circle. We are now basically filling in half of the circle. And so the distance between will also change our fill angle overall. And so if we want to fill a less than half of the circle, we can then change our distance between each object to 10, and now we're filling about a quarter of the circle at 90 degrees. So let's set it back to 36, and now we are filling the circle nearly fully, we can actually set our fill back to 360, and now our between distance has also modified itself slightly. Now we're back to filling in a full polar circle. We can of course change our rows, so we can change them from one to five. Now we have several rows of items, and our distance between each one can be modified just like with rectangular arrays. And our total distance can also be modified, and our between distance and total distances are connected, just like with rectangular arrays. We can also change whether this is associative or not. So if we wanted to have each individual square as a separate entity and not be able to modify the array further, we would turn associative off. In this case, we'll leave it on. And then let's look at the other options. We can rotate our items or not. So that means the items can remain fixed in their regular rotation and just be arrayed in a polar fashion. Or we can rotate them so that they can follow the curve. We can also choose what direction the items go in so we can reverse our direction. So right now our direction is going counterclockwise. And if we wanted to, we could reverse it and make it clockwise. Let's close this array. Let's inspect it again. Once again, associative is not available, but that's okay, because now if we wanted to turn this array into individual parts, we would just go back to home and we would explode it just like we did with the path array. And now each item is a separate entity. We can turn our arrays into 3D objects. Let's do it with our rectangular array first. So we're gonna use that, we're gonna press enter, and now that the array command has been initiated, we can start to modify this in the 3D realm. Let's give it five columns and five rows. And now we can access the levels area. So if we change our levels to five, for example, you might notice that the object seems to be a little bit brighter than it was before. That is happening because there's multiple objects on top of each other now. We can't really notice or tell, but if we hold the shift key and then hold our middle mouse button, we can activate 3D orbit and we can see that we have several objects on top of each other. 
we can change the distance between them. So from one to five, for example. Now they are all definitely more spread apart than before. And we can obviously change our total distance as well, which will modify the between distance. So if I change it to 25, our distance between each individual object is 6.25. There's one more parameter that we can modify, and that is under rows. And this is the increment between rows. So we're going to change our increment from 0 to 5. And now, if we look at this on the left view, we can see that the increment is quite interesting. What it does is we've now set it to 5, and so that means the total increment starts from 0 and ends at 5. So if there are 5 rows, essentially each row is one unit higher than the last one. And so that's how you can create a staircase effect. We can also do this for polar arrays. So let's create a polar array now. We can go to our array command, polar array, select our object, press enter, and then find our center point, and now we can make a polar array. So with polar arrays, we can do very similar things. Let's change our items from 6 to 10. Let's change our distance between them to, I'd say about 15 should work. There we go, that looks about right. And now we can create a very uh, interesting amphitheater-like effect. So we're gonna change our rows from one to five. Actually, we'll change it to 10 because the theater is a bit larger than that. And we can go to our levels, and right now we don't need any extra levels because we want each row to basically be its own level, but the increment is what matters. So if we change our increment from 0 to um, 10, for example, now we can go into our 3D view and we can see that we've now created seating, so to speak, at an incline. And so from the first point to the last point, there's 10 units, so each of the 10 units is basically one unit away from the other. And so now we can see how that can give us a very nice theater-like view. Thank you very much for watching this tutorial. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys learned something from it. Once again, my name is Ari. I'm with Digital Drafting Systems, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.